today we're going to be talking a little bit about kind of what Weave is and, and some of the developer components to it. And then in a little bit, Sam is going to join me out here and we're going to talk about Brillo. Um, and we're going to try to leave some time towards the end for Q&A as well. Uh, and there are some mics along the sides as well as on the balcony uh, for folks to line up for that if they need to. Um, so without further ado, let's dive in. Um, the, before we get into really what Weave is and, and kind of what the, the components there are, I want to talk a little bit more about the context uh, of, of some of what we're seeing of shifting user expectations in this area. Um, because that actually informed a lot of uh, what we were doing from, uh, from the Brillo and Weave side, and I think it'll help to understand why some of the decisions were made, um, particularly around privacy and security, but some other things as well. Um, so we're seeing actually a, a pretty quickly shifting landscape in terms of user expectations around devices. And here I don't just mean connected devices, but even uh, the devices that people normally have in their homes, at their offices, in a variety of different places. Um, and one of the first and the most visible ones of those is around the user's expectations around the experience with their devices. Um, so there was a time when, uh, in order to bring a device into your home, it was generally a look through the manual, figure out what magical combination of buttons and arrow keys to press on the top of it to get it set up. Uh, sometimes you might have to download a Windows application, and then you'd have to go through it finding the IP address of the device on the local network, and then opening up a browser to the onboard web server. And thankfully, those days are fast retreating from us. Um, but what that means is that users are also starting to expect that there's better experiences with regards to getting devices out of the boxes, that there are better experiences uh, with regards to uh, getting these devices um, uh, set up and then ready to use, and then, and then actually starting to use those. And that actually comes into the second piece of this, which is really about mobile experiences playing a larger role in users interacting with their devices. Um, so uh, again, back when users really needed, in order to have their computer talk to their device, um, that kind of experience didn't really work out very well because the computer wasn't very portable and often neither was the device. Uh, mobile has started to change that a bit. It's easier to carry around your mobile phone with you and interact with devices in whatever room of the house you're in or the, or the device you're talking to is in. Um, we're also seeing, as part of that growing interaction between mobile um, and the devices that we have in our homes, uh, the addition of in increased intelligence and kind of adaptation to the user's circumstances, to their behavior. Uh, we now have vacuum cleaners that know when we are or are not home and have the ability to learn our floor plans. And again, this is still very early days for a lot of that, but it's starting to shift user expectations around what their devices should be doing for them. Um, and that's something that we have to take into consideration to some extent as well. Um, another side of this that we're seeing as, as uh, we're kind of looking over at some of the landscape here is that these devices are starting to get better and better over time. Um, and the user expectations are starting to shift to orient around that as well. Um, this really kind of started to some extent with uh, the internet and with web applications and web services getting better each day you come back and reload the page. And then that, that carried over to the mobile landscape where the internet also allows the, the mobile experiences to get better day by day. And if you have a problem, if you have a bug, if, if things don't work quite the way you want, take the next app update and everything works better, or you hope so at least. Um, and so that, that kind of expectation is also starting to bleed over a bit into the connected devices space uh, and the consumer devices space, not just because the device itself maybe gets better, but also the experiences that come along with it are getting better uh, because you can update those mobile apps and these kinds of things. Um, the next piece is actually probably, to some extent, the most important piece of this, which is um, as connectivity starts to come to devices in the home, in the office, in these kinds of places, uh, with it comes all of the security and privacy considerations that have dominated really the rest of the digital age uh, altogether. And so uh, devices now have to play in the same security landscape to some extent, and user expectations around security and around privacy and ownership of their data uh, becomes just as important for these kinds of devices and for consumer electronics as it really has historically uh, for computers and for mobile devices and these kinds of things. Um, and the last piece is a little bit on the technical side in addition to on the consumer expectation side, but there's really an increased uh, expectation that these devices can actually update. Um, historically, devices, once they hit the shelves, were really frozen in time. Uh, you bring a device home and you, you can tell what year a kitchen was last remodeled just by taking a quick look at the devices in it. Um, but we can't really get continuous updates and continuous improvements to the experience 
um, if there's not an ability to update these kinds of devices. And more importantly, devices can't sit in the home for two years, five years, ten years, and continue to be secure with the constantly evolving uh, security landscape of the web um, if they're not updatable. And so there's an increasing expectation and, and reliance on these devices to be updatable uh, over the air. Um, so this is just, again, some context of some of what we're seeing looking out over the expectations landscape from the consumer perspective uh, that help to inform some parts of what you're going to see with regards to Brillo and Weave. So uh, with that, let's go into a little bit on, on kind of what Weave is as well as uh, the experiences that are actually, uh, that, are, that are part of Weave. Um, and then we'll lead right into some of the components that are available for developers because that's really the most important part here. And there will be several more talks over the course of today as well as tomorrow getting into not only specifics of the developer experience for parts of these, but also around uh, actual code labs so that you can get your feet wet and, uh, and try to play around with a lot of this. So the best way to think of Weave, I think, is as a, an application layer protocol. Uh, that tries to include a number of, of pieces that are fairly integral to, uh, to this kind of experience of building a connected device. Um, these include turnkey support for things like device discovery over a number of different transports, uh, for things like um, authentication against devices, and more importantly, in some situations, authorization for who or what has access to those devices. Um, it includes uh, provisioning and the ability to get a device set up out of the box. Um, and to go from out of box to ready to use uh, re as quickly as possible and as easily as possible. Um, and it also includes real-time communication in both directions uh, to try to make sure that if a client application or a service wants to tell a device you need to do this thing now, the device knows as quickly as possible that it needs to do that. And likewise, in the opposite direction, if the device's state updates, if the, if the status of that device changes, I'm now broken, the temperature has changed, any of these kinds of things, it's important they be able to notify applications and services that are subscribed to that state as quickly as possible. So this enables a variety of different kind of experiences that we're trying to, to make sure are built on top of this and to make sure are easily accessible to the user. The first and one of the more important ones of those is around the device setup experience. Um, so one of the things we found as we were talking to manufacturers is that actually this is where a lot of users fall off uh, the connectivity train. Um, a lot of these devices have different ways of setting up the device. Uh, again, it's still a combination of directional keys on the top of the device or some combination of those in an application that you have to find in the store and make sure you pick the right one with the right name and then download and install and all this kind of stuff. And it gets very cumbersome. And then on top of that, the user frequently needs to remember their Wi-Fi network password and a lot of other details that then just makes this a very difficult process. So uh, talking to manufacturers, we actually found that this creates uh, a lot of support volume um, and that this creates a lot of user confusion that ultimately leads to people not using the advanced features of their devices. So what we tried to do uh, was just bake this directly into Weave and to make it a simple, easy, consistent experience for users out of the box. Uh, so without, um, and you can see kind of parts of this experience here on Android, without the user needing to install an app, without the user needing to go and find anything to begin with, uh, they can just come directly to this experience, find the devices around them that are available to set up, choose the network that they want to get that device onto, if it's a Wi-Fi connected device, um, and importantly there on Android, we're actually able to, if that mobile device has connected to the network before, just pull the network password directly from the system uh, with the user's permission to make sure that the user doesn't have to go and hunt down the little notebook where they wrote down their Wi-Fi password two years ago or things like this. Um, and then take the user to a place where they can basically choose an account if they want to control authenticated access to this device, um, and then just get, uh, the, get the app and go directly into the experience that came with the device. So really the aim here is out of box to ready to use in less than a minute. Um, and we're trying to make sure that that's also a very consistent, simple experience so that users don't have to relearn it every time they get a new device. As long as they pick up one of these devices in the store, they should know exactly what to expect um, in, terms of, in terms of getting it set up and ready to go. There's a few other parts of the experience uh, that we also consider to be uh, very important uh, to, to kind of align this protocol around. Um, the first of which is, is being able to share access to these devices. So uh, mobile devices today are very one-to-one. -one. It's really, it's, it's a personal device. Um, and although you may have lots of accounts on it, oftentimes all of those accounts are you. Uh, and in very limited cases, they're shared between a number of different people. Um, these devices typically live in our homes and in office spaces, which are very much shared spaces. 
And as a result, being able to say something like, this is my family, I trust them, they all have access to this thing, uh, is a very important uh, capability to have. And likewise, uh, being able to say, these people are not my family, I do not trust them, uh, they are my tenants, and they should not be able to control these things and change the cost of washing machines and dryers, but they should be able to see them and to see whether or not they're currently in use so that they can decide when to go down and do the laundry. That's also equally important. So we've tried to make sure that from the ground up, these devices uh, are shareable and that it's very easy to users to grant access at different levels to different people. The next part of this that's important is making sure that this uh, protocol, and for, especially for that bi-directional communication, um, is fast and secure. Um, security, obviously, is a, is a fairly important piece on any transport, and that has to be taken care of, uh, as well as in a privacy-centric uh, fashion. The other side of it, though, is speed. A lot of people today, uh, when they flip a light switch or when they tell their microwave to turn off or these kinds of things, uh, expect instantaneous response. They expect the devices to do what they say and to do it immediately. Uh, once you get into connectivity and into a variety of different wireless transports, that starts to become a higher bar to hit. And so part of what we've tried to do is we've tried to layer, weave on top of uh, both the local network and remote hops through the cloud uh, and adding additional transports as we go along to try to make sure that we can always pick the fastest route to get a message to the device. So if your phone is on 4G and your light is on the local Wi-Fi network um, or on Beely, um, or in this case on the Wi-Fi network, then uh, the message would take a trip through the cloud and we'd get it there as quickly as possible. But if your phone is on the local network as well, that message shouldn't bother going to the cloud. It should just go directly to the light, and it should go as quickly as possible to make sure the user feels no noticeable delay there. Um, so that's part of what we mean by fast communication. The second piece of that that's important to us is consumers shouldn't have to know that, and they shouldn't have to understand that. So you may have a variety of different wireless protocols being used in your home. You shouldn't need to know anything about them in order to use these things. And all of this should be transparent to the user. The other half of that is that over time, we're hoping to make this relatively transparent to the application and the service developer as well. Um, because learning the different APIs for every different operating system and platform you're building on for controlling the Bluetooth radio or Wi-Fi or any of these kinds of things is a chore that really shouldn't be necessary. So we want to make it as easy as possible for you to say, take this command, send it to this light, find the best way to get it there. And that's something that we're trying to bake into the different client libraries that we make available as well. The last piece, or not quite the last piece, but um, the, one of the other important pieces of uh, the consumer experience that we feel is fairly important here is that users actually have a choice in applications and experiences. So one of the things that we've noticed, and you've probably noticed too, with Google services and applications, is we can build a fairly good experience for about 80% of people. And then what made that a great experience for them makes it not such a stellar experience for another 20%. Um, the things that make it good for some people don't make it so swell for others. And so it's important to us as we're building out this platform that we acknowledge, especially as you start to have a variety of different devices around you, a variety of different experiences, uh, that from the user perspective, um, there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. And we're not going to build a one-size-fits-all solution. And manufacturers aren't going to build a one-size-fits-all solution. There isn't going to be that in this space. And so we want to make sure that this platform is very, very open and allows uh, developers to build all kinds of different rich experiences that make sense for different types of users in different kinds of contexts. So the one other piece on the user perspective, uh, from the user perspective that's important uh, for us and that we've tried to make sure is enabled by this protocol um, is how to handle app and service access. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about granting users access, but what does it mean once you actually get access? Does that mean everything on your phone can talk to these devices? Does that mean if you grant a particular application access, it gets full access to all of your devices? Um, and the reality is there's different devices and different categories of devices that are more privacy sensitive or that are more security sensitive uh, or safety sensitive. So just because you've bought a toy that's a lot of fun and that you want to use an application with, uh, doesn't mean that application should also get access to your oven uh, or to your scanner if you happen to have left tax documents on it. Um, so one of the things that we're trying very hard to make sure that we uh, have enabled through this is the ability for a user, well, for an app developer to start, to be able to say, these are the types of devices I can work with. These are the types of things I need to be able to do with these devices. And then for the user to easily grant that access without over-granting a lot of additional access that the application really doesn't need and that the user shouldn't really need to trust that application with. 
Um, so this is a, another side of the access controls and permissions uh, piece of it. So going into the components a little bit of kind of what comprises Weave across the board, um, the first and, uh, and one of the key pieces is the Weave service as a whole. Uh, so by this I mean the Weave cloud service. Um, we've built out a service that users can register devices to that basically provides that cloud hop. It provides a set of REST APIs that make it very easy for web app developers and for uh, web apps and services to interact with devices and be part of this ecosystem. It also provides that cloud hop when a user is on their phone and they're on a different network than the device, um, or when the user's not at home but they want to double check that uh, everything's going well. Um, these kinds of things go through this cloud service. Um, and this is, uh, there's, a, there's a flip side to this that I think is very important to mention, which is um, this cloud service allows remote access, but the user doesn't have to use it. So the user always has the choice, and you might have seen that during the setup flow, of whether or not to associate any kind of account with this, and whether or not to enable any kind of remote access to their device. And if they choose not to, that's fine. All of these applications will still work in the local environment without any modification. Um, so this is one of the, the things that we feel is very important here. The user should always have the choice of whether or not uh, to associate their, their device with the cloud and have that type of remote access. So that's the cloud side of things. Um, on the device side, uh, naturally implementing this kind of protocol, especially with all of the security considerations and everything across different transports, is a little bit of a, of a mess. And so we've tried to take on as much of that work as we can uh, from the Google perspective, and we've built out a portable C++ library that can be taken into devices and used to enable them with Weave. Um, we've tried to slim out as many things that we can that might already be on an embedded system to make sure that we're not adding unnecessary resource usage. Um, and in order to do that, we've, uh, we've also provided several wrappers that make it easy to integrate this library onto common systems. And so naturally, Brillo is one of those. Uh, there's an Ubuntu wrapper available. And we'll be adding additional wrappers for additional system types as time goes on to make it easy to build uh, that kind of thing into um, the uh, devices themselves and, into, uh, the, and to make it easy for, for OEMs to build those experiences out. Um, the next piece of this beyond the cloud and the device side is naturally the client. And by client here I mean not just mobile client applications or desktop client applications but also web applications. Um, this is an area that, of course, is, is critically important if we want to have an ecosystem of these things. And so uh, on Android, as I mentioned, we've built the setup directly into Play Services to make it easy for users to get started even without an app. Um, and that goes back to Gingerbread. Um, on, uh, we also provide an implementation of the full protocol there uh, that your uh, client application, your Android application, can call into uh, in order to discover devices, send commands to devices, query state updates, these kinds of things. Um, the other side of this is, of course, iOS, uh, which is very critical as well. And people use a lot of different uh, phones in their homes, and uh, sometimes the same user has multiple, but other times uh, different users in the home have different uh, mobile devices. And so it's important that we provide all of that same functionality for iOS. So there, the setup flow is built directly into the client application since we can't build it into the system. Uh, and similarly, you get all of the same access to discovering devices, interacting with devices, subscribing to updates, et cetera, uh, from iOS applications. And the last side is, of course, web applications and services. And uh, we're actually very excited about the potential for new applications and services that interact with a variety of devices um, to be built. And so uh, similar to other Google APIs and web services, we've provided a variety of different client libraries um, for use in a variety of different languages, since there's such a diversity of frameworks and languages in use and building out web applications. Um, users on desktop can still set up devices. Uh, there's a Chrome app available from that, um, but we anticipate most of those users will be using mobile phones to do that. The other couple of things that we provide are, are a few things in the area of developer tools. Um, so uh, we'll have a couple of other conversations about this later. One of these is the command line tool, uh, which basically just uh, it allows you to register devices, send commands, query state updates, these kinds of things from the command line, either over the local network or remotely. Um, and this makes it very easy to uh, start testing things out and, and further to start building automation, and especially test automation uh, from, uh, from more popular environments for that. Um, the second piece, uh, which actually we're very excited about, and you'll hear a little bit more from Lawrence and from Sam later today, uh, is the Weave Developer Console. Um, 
And this both allows you to easily prototype devices uh, before you've even built a client application for them to start registering them, testing them out, sending commands, seeing the state in real time, these kinds of things. Um, and it also provides several features around fleet management that we hope will lead to more of that continuous improvement that we talked about earlier. So in particular, this is things like access to aggregated metrics about how the fleet of devices is being used to let you understand kind of how your users, what features are popular and what features are unpopular, and whether you have crashes going on and these kinds of things so that you can improve your devices over time. Um, and then on top of that, as I mentioned, over-the-air updates are very important. Again, we'll get into this more a uh, little bit later, uh, but we're trying to make that very easy from this developer console as well. The last piece that I want to talk about um, from the uh, Weave development side um, is interoperability and schemas. So everything that I've said so far during this presentation has made it sound like we're building a wonderful platform for building new silos on top of. Uh, and everyone knows that the, what the world really needs right now is more silos of, uh, of, of individual app experiences because we all really want to have one app for every device we bring into our home. Um, we've tried from a protocol standpoint to build in interoperability at a, at a, at a very uh, core layer of all of this. Uh, we've tried to make sure that you won't end up in that situation where you have one app per device. Um, and part of what we're doing for that is we're working very closely with all of the manufacturers that we work with to build schemas that represent a device's capabilities, that represent the types of states and commands that a device needs to use, so that uh, we can provide a stable interface to those devices uh, to developers on the other side, application developers, service developers, so that when you get access to a light, you know based on the schema for that that you will always find an ability to turn the light on and off for every light that you have access to. Uh, that you'll find that some lights are dimmable and some aren't, but because of Weave certification, if the light can be dimmed, you will have access to it, and you will have access in a stable way uh, so that you understand exactly how to dim that light. There's a flip side to these kinds of schemas and interoperability, uh, which is that if we're, if we're not careful, um, we'll end up boxing devices into the types of functionality they have today uh, and basically ensure that that's the only functionality they can ever have. So another part of how we've addressed schemas is ensuring that they're extensible, both in terms of capabilities for very popular device types, as well as in adding new capabilities all entirely that aren't related to current device types. So manufacturers can add new differentiating features, come up with improved ways to do things that are outside of the current schemas, as long as they're not blocking off the core functionality to you to use the typical core functionality of that type of device. So this allows these devices to continue to evolve for more interesting and exciting things to be added to the ecosystem of devices over time without cutting off the interoperability piece. And the certification program kind of keeps those things separate and ensures that core uh, interoperable devices are always consistent. Um, the one other thing that I think is worth mentioning there is there will be some device types that are totally new. Uh, there will be some device types that aren't common in homes and may not make sense for us to define a schema yet for just because it's very early days. And so for communities that are trying to build those types of devices, the schema format does let you come up with new commands and capabilities and states, and you can have a, a totally custom device as long as it's not of a type that already is out there and has a schema for it. And so for communities building new device types, you can think of where maybe 3D printing was a few years ago. Um, those communities can come together and start to agree upon a way to represent this device and can get interoperability using these schemas in their community, uh, even before a proper schema has been, has been kind of created as part of this system. So we want to make sure that this whole thing is very open and extensible to that as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Sam. Sam is going to talk to us a little bit more about the Brillo side of things um, and what we've built out there. And then again, we'll leave a few minutes towards the end in case you have any questions uh, so that we can answer those. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, everyone. My name is Sam Beter, and I'm a product manager on Brillo. So today I'm going to walk you through some of the details of Brillo and how it can make the development of your devices easier and also make them simpler to maintain. So first I want to talk about what kind of devices do we mean when we talk about Brillo devices. So one problem with the Internet of Things is that it means everything to everyone. And it means a lot to us too, but here is just one taxonomy of how you can break up the classes of devices that we're talking about with Brillo specifically. One important thing to note is that with Brillo, it's not focusing on terminals. 
And one reason for that is that Google already has other products, such as Android for tablet, Chromecast, Android TV, et cetera, that are fixing a lot of problems with terminals. But there's this whole class of other devices where we think Brillo is a perfect fit. Uh, so there's the idea of human augmentation with wearable technologies. There's robotics, there's drones, there's enchanted objects that can power your smart home. So as you as developers are trying to build some of these devices, uh, we want to make it as easy as possible. And so before I go into the details of Brillo, I want to first break down a few of the common developer challenges that as we're making Brillo, we want to make sure that we solve. So what are some of these common developer challenges? One major component that we want to focus on is security. So Andrew already briefly mentioned security, but we think that any IoT device needs to have a really strong security story. And the reason for that is you need to retain the trust of the user. They need to trust that they can use this device and it'll keep their information private. We think it's hugely important uh, also because some of the devices that are currently in the marketplace don't necessarily have a strong enough story with respect to security. And so uh, this is a really big deal because if your device isn't prepared for any potential security flaw, you need to have a plan before the flaw comes into place. Once, the, once it's the day that the, you know, the, the, once the news story comes out about this flaw, uh, you only have a day to make this change. You can't have it rolling out over the coming months. So this is a really big deal, and we think that for IoT to be successful in the long term, uh, this needs to be stronger in every device that's out there. So what's the next common developer challenge? Not only does this device that you make need to be constantly connected and secure, but it needs to actually be delivering additional value to your users. So both you know, your company and the end user are going to expect additional functionality, additional features, and new information that they can get from these devices. Next is staying competitive. So when you make these IoT devices, they need to be secure, have new features and everything, but at the same time, you can't be increasing the cost of this device by very much. In order to be successful in the marketplace, the cost of these IoT devices need to be the same or very little, a very small amount more than the non-IoT counterparts to this device. Finally, you need to do all these things at scale. So we think Brillo is a perfect fit to address all these challenges. Uh, so what is Brillo? What is Brillo? Brillo is an Android-based operating system that has built-in support for Wii. Um, because Brillo is Android-based, if your chip vendor already supports Android, then they can support Brillo. And this allows for a greater ecosystem of these compatible hardware devices, or development hardware. Um, it also allows you, if, you're, if you need to switch which hardware you're using, it's much easier with Brillo because there's a lot of options out there. Next, there's a Brillo Developer Kit, or BDK, that we give you to make your development process easier within Brillo, and it allows you to configure your operating system and build the device image. You can change anything about the device image since you're building from source, so we're really not gonna stay in your way with anything you wanna do with your device. Finally, there's a set of features such as updates, metrics, and crash reporting to continue interacting with your device once it's already been launched. Now let's go through all these in a little bit more detail starting with what it means for Brillo to be Android-based. Um, so Brillo is based on just the lower level layers of Android. What this means is that it's based on the non-Java native layers of Android, and it's a stripped down version of Android that is specifically made for connected embedded devices. Brillo also has this well-defined board support package and product concepts that make your device much more maintainable. So because the board support package is completely separated from your product code, you can update each independently. This also makes it much more easy to plug in a new BSP if you ever want to. 
We also focused on making Brillo really modularized. So what this means is that, say for example, your device has no need for graphics. You can take out all the graphics components, and this will make your end device much slimmer, and the end product will be cheaper, which, as we mentioned, is really important. Uh, also, all of Brillo is open sourced and developed in the Android Open Source Project. It's, it's there right now, so you can, you know, totally transparent exactly what's going into Brillo. You can go check it out. So these are all features that you get because Brillo is, you know, Android based. And next I want to talk about security because we also worked really hard on making sure that we have a strong security story with Brillo. So Brillo has a verified boot architecture that is, can be used to check all executable code. This, this verified boot architecture helps ensure that the image you put on the device is the same image that runs. Brillo also has software fault isolation by default. Um, so all the Brillo built services are sandboxed and deprivileged, and you have the capability of making it so that your devices run in the same way. This makes sure that if there is a problem in one of the components of your device, it won't you know, make it so that there's a problem in the whole device. Sooner or later, there might be a security problem with your device, and for that, uh, Google provides ongoing security fixes with supported releases. Um, we also have our updates go all the way down through the firmware and bootloader so that when, you, when we provide fixes to these devices, it'll completely fix the problem. It'll you know, go through the whole device. So this is our story for security. We have another talk specifically on security because we think this is really important for any IoT device. And next I want to talk about the Brillo Developer Kit, or BDK. So Brillo provides a number of tools that will make your actual development process easier. Brillo has standard embedded uh, development architecture using ADB and Fastboot. There's also this out of tree and uh, configuration model where all of your code is in your separate tree, which allows you to continue using all of your existing development tools and revision system. Uh, and so it's, it's entirely in your own tree. You control it completely. But at the same time, you build the device image from source. So if there is a specific kernel configuration that you want to change, you have that capability. And for those who know Android development a little already, uh, there's some other you know, native development tools that we provide that makes your life a little easier. Uh, Brillo uses Binder, and so we give you some C++ ADL generation that you can use. There's also a NIT and security configuration and unit and integration testing. So these are all ways that make the development process within Brillo easier. But as I said before, once you deploy your device, you may want to continue improving it. And so for that, there's updates. So with Brillo, you can send updates to some or all of your devices over the internet. This allows you to continue improving your device and fixing bugs after launch. Uh, it's built on the same infrastructure as Android, so it scales really well to all your devices. Uh, you can you know, rest assured that millions of devices will be able, be, able, be able to update effectively. Since these IoT devices are constantly connected to the internet, you don't really want to have these updates you know, interrupt the flow of the devices. And so to that end, we have these updates download in the background, and you can control when the device reboots to apply the changes. We also make sure that the update payload and the image are independently secured. What this means is that uh, the download integrity is maintained separately from the image integrity. So the payload integrity is secured by Google, so that you know that you're downloading uh, the actual changes that you pushed out. And finally, the image integrity is protected by you with your private key, so you know that what's running on the device is the change that you made. So updates are one way to interact with your device once it's been in the field. Uh, however, you're going to want to also receive information from these devices. And to do that, we have the developer console and metrics and crash reporting. 
So with metrics and crash reporting, you can see with your devices how they are performing in the field. So for example, let's say we, you have a set of refrigerator motors. Uh, and in this case, the refrigerator motors uh, are using 10% more energy than you would expect. With this graph on the left, you can imagine this showing the efficiency of these motors, and you could see right there, really immediately, that they're using more energy than you would think. There's also crash reporting data that you can see for any things that are failing about the motor. So these tools are, we think, really useful to quickly iterate on bugs and improve the device. Uh, because of the update tools I just mentioned, if there is a problem, you can, you can provide a fix and see the results in the developer console. And you can, you can go back and forth and iterate to fix the problem in much quicker than before. The alternative of, of waiting for users to report an issue or having to go into the field yourself costs more and is just less effective. All this data is aggregated in a way that retains privacy for the end user. So all these features I just mentioned, security, the Brillo developer kit, updates, metrics, and crash reporting, are made so that your development process is easy. But we realize that it's also important to make sure that the process of, of taking your existing work and bringing it to Brillo is easy as well. So for that, I want to touch on adoption. We, we worked really hard in Brillo to make sure that it'll exist well in your existing workflow. So because Brillo is Android-based, there is this wide set of industry support, so you can likely keep your chip supplier. In addition to that, if you need to change hardware because a different set of hardware will make your device more effective or cheaper, we make that really easy too. Secondly, most embedded devices today are already built using C and C++, so you can likely keep your language as well. In addition to that, because of this out-of-tree concept where all of your code is in a separate tree, you can, we're not going to stay in your way if you want to use a different language. Next, Brillo has wide support for a large set of third-party libraries. So these facts together make it so that the process of bringing your code into the Brillo environment as easy as we can make it. And so finally, I want to go through a thought exercise. Uh, suppose that there is a major security vulnerability in a single library in all of your IoT devices, and you need to fix it. If this is a major threat, you need to get this fixed out tomorrow, not over the coming months. So here's our task. Patch this newly discovered vulnerability in a single library of all of your company's IoT devices. As you're frantically looking for how to fix this, some of these questions might be running through your head. Do you know if all of your devices are running the same version of the library? Do you know if the patch is compatible with the other system software on the device? Do you know if your Linux provider has given you the patch, or do you have to do it manually? Next, once you have this fix, how are you going to push it to all of your devices? And finally, even after you've pushed it to your devices, how will you know if it's working? With Brillo, we make answering these questions really easy. Once a vulnerability becomes known, Google can identify and quickly generate a fix. All you need to do is download the new BDK, press Make, generate the new firmware, and push it out. The stage rollouts will kick in, and you'll see in the developer console as the patch is being adopted by our users. So this process for this very real threat that could happen becomes really simple with all the tools and features that I just mentioned. So I'm going to leave you with our call to action. So everyone here at this conference now has access to the Brillo and Weave uh, developer sites. So you can go on those sites, go and download the BDK, start running through the code labs, uh, we have a large set of code labs that can get you started making your device, trying an idea. And we also have many other talks today uh, that can go into more detail about some of the things that I, I mentioned. Um, we also have demos layered today. And 
uh, we'll have some time right now to answer your questions. Thank you. So, Andrew can come back out here. As, as we mentioned before, there's two mics down here and then one mic in the balcony that you can use. So there's the mics there and... Yeah, the one complicating factor is we can barely see <laughs> mics. So uh, if, we, if we don't catch you offhand, wave really fast. Uh, <laughs> So the question was, is there any invitation necessary for using the SDK, or I'm sorry, the BDK? Um, uh, all of this is open source and is, and is available right now. The documentation and everything is still early access. Um, so you can't get access to the documentation yet outside of this conference. Everyone in this conference has access to this today. Yes, is there a question over here? No, I think there's no. a question right here. Okay, thank you. Um, this question about Brillo, sure. if I'm, if I've got a, a device, a connected device that has a display screen on it, is there support for that in Brillo, or is that sort of beyond its remit? Uh, so the question is, if you have a device that has a display screen, is that supported by Brillo? Yeah, sort of, you know, obviously, if you put full Android on the device, you know, you get all the UI with it. Yeah. So, so I would say that it's not the focus of Brillo, but these things are, you can make anything work really with Brillo. And so since it's, you know, the product is in your own tree, there are capabilities to have a display screen. But that's really not the focus of Brillo right now. Uh, Brillo is improving over time. And so as more and more updates come out, the capability for that might become easier. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm just, uh, I'm really excited to add uh, Weave support to my app. Just wondering kind of when do we expect uh, devices to start coming out for uh, being available to consumers? Are there any available now or what is it like year or six months or what? Sure, um, so around uh, timelines for apps and for hardware uh, relating to Weave. Um, so the, the general release of Weave uh, will be uh, later over the course of the next quarter or so. Um, in terms of hardware expecting later this year. Uh, to have hardware out. Um, and since you have access to the developer site and to more information about things, you'll also have the ability to check there on the types of devices we've built schemas around, so you can figure out what devices you can start building application experiences around easily. I Thanks. think we have someone in the balcony. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are we restricted to any particular cloud service for using this? Um, so the question is around, are you restricted to any particular cloud service to use Weave? Um, and and uh, presumably also some of the Brillo services. Um, so in order to ensure op interoperability and the fact that the users always are able to use these devices from any application they want, uh, devices do need to, if they're, if they're uh, certified to use Weave, need to be able to register against the Weave cloud. Um, in terms of building other cloud services and web services and these kinds of things, we've tried to make a very easy developer experience to tie those in so that they can interact with these devices too. And I think this is the, a similar story for, uh, for Brillo services. Yep. So uh, we provide a variety of services out of the box. You can always, of course, bring along more and add more to your device. We have a question here in the front. Yes. Yeah, so the question was around, does Weave also handle network management? And in particular cases where uh, the device may lose connection to the network or the user may need to set it up to a new network. Sure, and to discover devices on the network from the client app perspective and these kinds of things. So yes, um, so uh, the Weave library uh, for the device side um, does need to be tied into the network management stack to do particular things like handle provisioning from the device side. Um, it also takes care of if the device falls off the network, uh, making itself available to be brought back on, say if a user changed their network password or these kinds of things. Um, but otherwise, there can be other logic on the device as well that's handling the network stack. Uh, from the client application side, um, the Weave uh, uh, SDKs for Android and for iOS um, does handle interfacing with the system for handling the protocol over the different transports. Yeah, so Weave is an exclusive. You can use other protocols with these devices as well. Absolutely. Uh, yes? Uh, the list of devices, by that, do you mean the schemas that are available for interacting with devices or the developer boards or? Uh-huh. 
I see. So, there, uh, so the question is, where does the user maintain a list of, of all of the different devices they have access to and the ability to control that? So we provide a, a core UI that users can use both on the web as well as on Android for, for finding the devices they have access to and making sure they have a fallback place to control access to those devices. There's someone at that mic. A yeah. couple of questions. Uh, so what, what are the supported network interfaces for Vue? And secondly, what kind of considerations given for offline mode when devices go offline and come back online? Kind of yeah. Um, so around network for interfaces used by Weave and uh, how do we handle offline? Um, so network interfaces, uh, Weave is currently available over the local network as well as through that cloud hub. Um, BLE support will be coming relatively soon um, over the course of the next few months. Um, in terms of uh, offline capabilities, as I mentioned, uh, it, it's very important to us that these devices work as well, even if the user isn't registering them with the cloud, even if the user isn't going through the cloud. Uh, and so the devices will continue to work over the local network just as well. Um, one of the things that you won't see quite in the set of software that's available for you as part of this early access to folks at the conference, but that's actually coming very soon, is the same layer of access control over the local network as you get through the cloud. Uh, so the same ability to authorize particular applications and not others, to authorize particular users and not others, even when the device is offline, to make sure that the user, even if their phone is offline or their device is offline, is still able to get into their home to use these things. Do you maintain the state of the devices and cache them? Uh. Yeah, so um, we do cache the state of the device cloud side for remote access. Um, the state of the device is also easily discoverable if you're local with the device and you have access to it. I have a question here on the side. Right. Sure. So the, the question is around what kinds of auditing are we doing to make sure that devices that have the Weave brand on it or that are using Brillo mm -hmm. are, uh, are secure out of the box. Um, and there's a couple of different layers to that. As you mentioned, certification is a very important place uh, where we do a, a degree of testing around all of the different kinds of issues that we can from a black box perspective to ensure that this device isn't susceptible to common security issues. A second part is part of the schemas that we define is defining the minimum role necessary for common types of functionality with the device. So as I mentioned, there's different types of access, different levels of access that make sense for different types of capabilities. Um, each of those levels of access uh, should be relevant to the type of functionality on the device. Like you may want to see whether a scanner is on and off. That doesn't mean you should be able to see what's on sitting on the document scanner, these kinds of things. And so that's actually part of the certification program as well, is testing that default state and making sure that it actually implements those minimum roles that are defined as part of the schema. The, yes, that is. So the question was, uh, is it also just saying having a minimum role for, for a particularly sensitive state like the lock state uh, may be too sensitive for anyone? Um, the, the roles go up to a fairly high level, including the owner of the device. And so the way to handle that is a minimum role is owner. And yes, that will be verified as, as part of certification. So the gentleman, yes. So the, the question was around um, if you have a home full of Brillo and Weave devices and uh, you have them all set up, they're all tied to you, and then you move. Um, and then there's a couple of implications of that. How do you make sure that the other person who's moved in can't get access to your kinds of data or things you've done historically with these devices? And vice versa, how, do you, how does that new person make sure that you don't have uh, the ability to snoop on them and things like this? Um, so these are great questions, actually. The, uh, in the first case, the data is, again, all tied to your account. Uh, even if, you, if it's fully local and you never associated it with any account, it's tied to the devices you used with it. Uh, so that new person coming in isn't going to be able to see anything historical about how these devices were used. Um, the flip case of how does that person make sure that you basically kick you out of the home fully and make sure that your devices aren't spying on them or doing things like that, um, all devices have to have a way to reset them if you have physical access. Yeah. So, 
So there's always going to be a way. Now, there's, there's easier ways for you to actually transition uh, to give that ownership to them. At the moment, the easiest way to do that is simply to delete that device and let it go back into a provisionable mode. Um, at the moment, uh, reprovisioning everything is the best way to do it. We're looking in ways to handle uh, ownership transfer, but there's a lot of security implications that come with that, too. So uh, maybe a related question what the gentleman asked. So whenever today an end user uh, buys an Android phone, they have to create a Google account and to use an Android phone. And whenever there is a, an OEM publishes a newer version of Android, the user accepts the end user agreement and update the device to a later version of Android. So are we going to have a similar model here that uh, everyone who will use the end devices will need to have a Google account and they will have a new updates of Brillo or we board sort package or application through the OEM program where the end user will update the new, can end user will decide whether they want an update or not. So I heard two questions there. Yeah. So is the main question that can the user decide whether or not they're update, updating? Did I understand that correctly? Uh, first of all, will the user have a login? And second, does the user decide to update to the newer version of operating system as application board? So I can at least answer partially, and then I think Sam can probably give a little bit more detail on the Brillo side. Uh, the user doesn't have to have a Google account to use any of these things. Um, the user doesn't have to associate it for remote access or any of that kind of thing. Uh, and if they don't have an account, they should still be able to use these devices in their home without an issue. Um, in terms of the second question of, uh, of updates, um, as part of the Weave program, actually, and the certification, we're also ensuring there's an update mechanism in place so that security fixes and things like this can get out to these devices. Uh, and so at least on the, uh, from the Weave perspective, um, it, there has to be a balance based on device type of whether things auto-update in the background or whether or not the user needs to be there to actively uh, authorize something to the device. Um, finding the right balance between that friction uh, of the user and also keeping things safe is one of the things that we're going to be working manufacturer by manufacturer and uh, on to try to make sure it works well. Yeah, and just to add, with Brillo, we are really encouraging, we're making sure that we encourage all developers of products to push out these updates, you know, these security fixes, and improvements to their device. Uh, and there's, we're working on the same balance uh, to figure out exactly how to weigh uh, you know, forcing updates versus uh, just encouraging them. I think the preference is, uh, is to try to make sure that auto updates happen seamlessly uh, in the background to some extent, but in certain places that can be disruptive to the user experience, and so we want to be conscientious of that and make sure that that doesn't happen. We have a question right over here. Sure. So um, just to clarify, the question was around, um, let's say you're a manufacturer overseas who's building a particular device type. Um, your government and Google have a falling out uh, and agree to go separate ways. Uh, can you I explain to me in a little bit more detail what that would entail? I see. So the question is around, uh, would Google uh, cut off access for OEMs within a particular country? What happens if that happens? What recourses does the manufacturer have? These kinds of things. Um, so the, uh, I think this starts to stray into some of the legal territory, and that depends on the context of what exactly happens there. Um, I can say at the moment there's no restriction on these services outside of embargoed countries that U.S. law dictates uh, Google can't act within. Um, so that I would be surprised if that were to happen, but it would depend on the particularities of the circumstances. Okay. Oh, we have a question here in the back. Yeah, to beat a dead horse, um, re regarding uh, caching device information in the cloud, uh, some industries, due to compliance, uh, can't use, well, they have to use their own cloud or their own private cloud or their own old-fashioned LAN. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the situation there? And then secondly, somewhat related to that, but more on an OEM basis, like compliance with things like FIPS 140, uh, certain security protocols, that's like that's the only way certain vendors can sell to, say, uh, certain federal uh, government institutions and whatnot. Uh, what's the status there? And related to that, 
code signing, how do you make sure that the signing is the, the integrity of that? Okay. Uh, so the first part of the question is around uh, different markets uh, and, and particular device types have certain requirements uh, from a regulatory standpoint or from a certification standpoint uh, in terms of security certifications or potentially uh, HIPAA compliance or these <coughs> kinds of things as to where they can store data. The second part of the question is around code signing for, uh, I, I think you're mainly talking about firmware updates and things like this, is that right? Yes, and maintaining the integrity of it. Right. So um, just to talk to the former a little bit, uh, naturally there are some areas that, uh, that Weave isn't suitable for the, at the moment, and that includes some things like, um, like uh, healthcare devices that deal with HIPAA compliant data. Um, it's going to be a device by device type uh, kind of conversation there. Um, over time, Google has incorporated a variety of different um, of certifications into its cloud infrastructure for particular cases, but that's it, it's a little bit nebulous to, to try to talk to that right now. If you have a particular device type in mind and a particular set of, of regulations in mind, I'd be interested in talking after. Sure. Um, go ahead. Um, I think we're just about out of time, so I might just answer this and then uh, move on to the next talk. But so, is, what, was there any part of the question that I missed? So specifically, uh, signing uh, firmware updates and software to make sure that it can't okay. be interfered with en route and that it's uh, what was meant for that device. So we do take measures to make sure that the thing that is going on the device is the same thing that you pushed out. Uh, so I think that maybe the best advice is we have a security talk later today, and so going to that I think should answer your questions, or if it doesn't, maybe ask this question again yeah. and. Paul will definitely be able to answer it. Right. The, the quick up answer is uh, there will be signing of updates, uh, and Paul can probably go into a little bit more detail later today. Um, but uh, that's definitely a part of the auto-update infrastructure. Cool. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you guys for your time.